There are many of you here tonight that don't even remember World War II. There are those of you that are learning that there was a war, followed by the Korean War, followed by the conflict in Vietnam. But many of you don't even remember those days. And I'm sure that those who do remember could never believe, as I could not have believed, that within just a matter of two months after Pearl Harbor, that the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy could have taken Hong Kong, China, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, came down the back door into Singapore through Malaysia, and that within those two months, they were making their inroads in the Dutch East Indies. I had been a missionary in New Guinea. I had walked over the trail from the south coast into the interior. My first husband was the first missionary that ever went into the heart of the western half of the island. And I waited a year and a half before they gave me permission and I joined my husband in the interior, crossed 14 mountain ranges, and I shall never forget that first day when I came to the top of the mountain range and saw below me the first of the villages among these precious Kapauku people, Stone Age people who had only been discovered just a year or so before. And I remember the carrier saying to me, Ega, Niwe, quickly now, let's go. And I finally got to the top of the mountain, and they were so excited because they realized that we really were human beings just as they were, and uh, they wanted us to hurry and get there, not only because we were novel, being people from the outside world, but because of the fact they realized now that all of the things that my husband had told them about God who loved them and his son Jesus Christ was available to them too. Before they had always said, but if Jesus loved you, he didn't love us because we're just human beings and you're spirit beings. But after I recorded their folklore moving across the mountains, I realized that all of these people believe that the known world is that pocket in the mountains there where they live, that people die and their spirits go over those mountains, and because we came from the other side of the mountain out of the spirit world to them, and no one of the early group who went in there had a wife, none had children, so if they weren't spirits, how did they come into existence in the first place? And that's a natural question for them to uh, And so they decided they were going to kill some of the Dutch people, from the government post, and if the spears went through them, they would know that they were, they were spirit beings if they didn't die. But if they died, then they would know that they were human beings. And uh, a government party was uh, uh, ambushed by a group of our natives, and in self-defense, the police had pulled up their guns and killed seven of our people, and things were very serious. So it was either they bring women into the interior or they get more police, or they abandon the post in the interior. And here I was, and these carriers with me knew that we were human beings just like they were, and I came to the top of the mountain that day, and I looked down, and I saw the people coming out of the gardens and rushing up the mountainside to greet me. Half your crowd goes, whoo! The other half says, whoo! So you get, whoo, whoo, whoo! And I was so excited, I was running down the mountainside to greet them, and I was waving my hands, and the tears were running down my cheeks, and I said, I'm home, I'm home. And for 43 years, that was home to me. And those were my people. And as I came up there, everybody rushed up to me. Everybody gave me a gift. Everybody gave me the same kind of a gift. It was a roasted sweet potato. I had my arms full. I finally sat down on the side of the mountain. They poured them into my lap and around me, and I... Uh, just then, one of the carriers tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Mama, Kapaga Edupa is coming. The chieftain of this village is coming up. And I saw this older man with a bunch of arrows and his bow in his one hand. He stood up in front of me, and he looked down at me. And then he looked up on the mountainside. My husband was coming down the mountainside. I had these very heavy boots, like the field police wear with the cat's claws on them because of the broken bottle limestone. 
He was wearing the same kind of boots, and I knew what was going through his mind. I had heavy leggings on to protect you from the um, the leeches there. When you get into your camp at night, the, you took off your leggings. You went over your legs with iodine or matches to get the leeches off. And he was wearing the same kind of leggings I had on heavy cocky trousers. So did he. I had a heavy cocky shirt with long sleeves. So did he. I had a big rain hat. He had on a, a, an Australian Army hat. And he looked down at me and he said, Aki Agamome, are you a woman or not? I said, yes, I am. He said, and they turned down their lower lip. He said, Vail, you're not. I said, yes, I am. And one of the carriers who was on the trail with us, he came and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Mama, let your hair down. And I've let my hair down many a time before the people, literally that is. He said, and mother of mine, indeed you are a woman. No man ever had hair like that, so it must be a woman. And from that moment on, I walked into their village and into their hearts, and they walked into mine. And uh, I was so thrilled when the day came, and I could tell them that God so loved the world in their language. And then the day came when we came back. We had made trips into the outer reaches of this tribe of 60,000 people. And when we walked into camp that night, we heard that Holland had been invaded and Holland had fallen within five days. And that day when we had stood and heard that uh, uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed, we knew that it could not be very long before we would also be involved very personally in this war. And we watched as the boats came down the Macassar Straits. Instead of coming into the port of Macassar, where all the fortifications were, they came in a place in the south coast on the isle, on the um, the uh, beach at Brombong. There wasn't a shot fired there. They just walked in and just took over the place. And of course, we waited for them after they made their. Uh, landing on the 8th day of February, and finally they came up and they said uh, that we were prisoners, that we were to, at the present time, remain there, not have contact even with the natives around you to get food, nothing. If you're ever seen off of this property, you'll be shot on sight. The men were badly beaten, and uh, then they said, uh, we're leaving you now, we will be back again. The second time they came back was Friday the 13th of March. They said, we're going to take the men somewhere else to and imprison them, and the women are to remain here. And I ran into the house when he said, go and get some, no suitcases, but get some of your husband's clothes. And I ran into this little house, and I grabbed up a pillowcase, and I put in some of his clothes and his Bible, a notebook, and a pen, and then as I came out, one of the officers was motioning for me to come. I ran over to the Jaffrey house. Dr. Jaffrey was in his bedroom with one of the officers. He said, now what is wrong with this old man? And I said, well, and I began to enumerate the things that were wrong with him because Dr. Jaffrey had been very ill. I said he was in a coma on the coast just before you people came, and I said he has a heart condition. He also has Uh, kidney condition, and I went on to name all of the things that were wrong with him, and he said, well, anybody that needs all the medicine that man man needs is not going to last very long anyway, so he'll just stay here. Just tell him he doesn't need to pack. Well, I knew that the only thing Dr. Jaffrey was using was saccharin, and uh, I couldn't understand what all this medicine was that he was packing. And so after they had gone, I went in to uh, see him, and I said, Dr. Jaffrey, what was all this medicine that he said you were packing there? He said, I, I realized that if they took us out of the mountains, they must be going to take us down to the coast. And he perspired profusely. He loved eau de Clone to put on his handkerchief and to my, mop his face with. That was what he was packing. And that uh, officer thought that it was uh, medicine. But you know, that was God just keeping that man with us. We needed a man there on the property. And I've often thought how God brings to naught all of the machinations of the enemy. And uh, so I, then I ran out after telling the officer all the things that were wrong with him, and I ran out, and I saw that, that Mr. Dibler was already in the truck. And I ran up to it and, I ha- to it, and I handed him the little bundle of clothes and things, and I thought they could have at least waited till I could say goodbye to him. They'd already started up the motors, and he looked down at me, and he said, Honey, just remember one thing, dear. 
that God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I'll tell you tonight that I really thought there were times when my God had left me and forsaken me. I never saw him again. That day we realized that we were there and uh, that we were going to have to make some kind of gardens. We were going to have to find some way to keep alive. Um, We had, among other things, to contend with rats. One of the things that I have said, uh, if I ever have time, I'm going to write a book on the rat and I. I could tell you so many stories about rats. I've had rats always in my missionary life and uh, in the Baling Valley where we were among the cannibals and I was adopted by the chieftain as his daughter. We had rats in there that weighed 30 pounds. That's a rat. They were true rodents. We were there for about a year and finally they came and said that they, we were living in much too much luxury. They were going to take us somewhere else. So they took us five kilometers farther into the interior and then they pointed across a valley and up on the mountainside there were some crude shacks over there and they said now you're going to go over there and uh, there are many things about those months there that I have blocked out of my memory I the Lord brought to my recollection some of the things that happened and but the things that I remember most about it is seeing the faith of a man like Dr. Jaffrey you know um It wasn't until I was writing this book that I realized that that flashlight of Dr. Jaffrey's and those batteries that he had lasted for over two years and never once did they go out. There was no way to to, to get new ones. And uh, Dr. Jaffrey needed that flashlight and I said to him, how is it that they have never discovered your flashlight? He said, when I hear them coming, and we would always sound the alarm. Everybody knew when they were coming. And he said, I just go up there, and I lift up my pillow, and I put that and my father's watch under there. And I say, Lord, these things are meaningful to me. I need that flashlight and this watch they don't need. That was my father's. And I put the pillow back down on there. And you know, watching those soldiers, when they would come, they just loot the place. And they would always come to Dr. Jaffrey's bed. They'd grab the mattress at the foot end and throw it up over that pillow. And then they would look for something that might be hidden there. And then they never lifted up the pillow. And Dr. Jaffrey would come in, conscious that they were going to be there. He would put down that mattress. He would lift up the pillow, put his watch back up on the little stand beside the bed. I saw the man of faith that he was. Those were very precious experiences to me. And the time when um, he stood at the end of my bed there, and I had been out working in the garden. I thought it was a sunstroke, and I had a very high fever, and there was no way they could get it down. And I remember Dr. Jaffrey standing at the foot of the bed, and he had his hands on the iron bedstead and he just looked up without even closing his eyes he said lord it's difficult to be sick at any time but he said especially in this time of war and when these soldiers come he said would you keep them away as long as darling is sick in bed and you know i was in bed for six weeks before my fever finally came down and never once did any soldiers come to that place And I said, the day I got up and I had dressed for the first time and gone out, the alarm went off and said, soldiers are approaching. I said, Dr. Jaffrey, couldn't you just said six months (laughs) instead of six weeks? After we had been there about six months, they came and said, we're going to take you somewhere else and intern you. We packed up a few things. We were only allowed to take three other dresses beside the one we wore. So I put on all the clothes I could get on. I was within six months of furlough when the war came, so I knew my clothes wouldn't last very long. And we went from the place where we were staying there, across the mountain, over to the uh, village of Molino, where the Dutch people had been in turn. And uh, that night we slept in a church. We put the older people up on the benches in the church, and we slept down underneath on the on the uh, floor waiting for the trucks and the trucks were beginning to pull in at dark and then just as it was just getting light in the early morning hours we heard them start to rev up the trucks and everybody was beginning to move and I can remember lying there and thinking um, 
Oft methinks I hear his footsteps stealing down the paths of time, and the future dark with shadows brightens with a hope sublime. And I thought, Lord, couldn't you just come back today? And always there was there, even in the darkest of the days, the realization that God was there and things became bright again. I remember that day as we got into those trucks and they were just stake beds and there wasn't even a tailgate on there, so the younger one of us joined our arms together so that we could make a cordon around the older people in the center of the truck bed and uh, there was one up on either side that held on to the cab so that we wouldn't be thrown out because with all of those people that they loaded into the back of these trucks, they drove just as fast as they could and round the corners, and we were just sure that somebody was going to be thrown off of that truck or the whole lot of us were going to go down the mountainside. The hundreds of feet below, you could see the valleys down there. But by the time we finally got to the coast, they pulled up into an area that they had been making into an internment camp. We looked and saw these um, great long barracks. They were about a half block long. And they said, this is where you're going to be staying. We, uh, they divided us up into groups, the Dutch people in most of the barracks, and then all of the foreigners were in the one barracks. And uh, I was chosen, I think, perhaps because of the fact that I was fluent in, in Dutch and also Indonesian as well as English. And uh, I was head of this largest barrack in the camp. We called it the Heinz Barrack because we were almost 57 varieties. There weren't many nationalities that weren't represented there. And yet, being so many people from so many different areas of the world, God just brought us together. And I'm sure it was because every night I called them together and we all came up to the front of the barracks and I read God's word to them And then we had prayer together, and there were out of those that gathered with me there, those that came to know Jesus Christ and could thank God for that war because they came to know him as Lord and Savior. We had to um, have people to work and fulfill all of the jobs that were given us by the Japanese. We were providing for their army that was gathering in around us. We were between two of their largest airfields. uh, We made their uniforms. The older women knit socks for them. We worked in rice fields and mud up to our hip. And, of course, in the mud so that we got these uh, terrible tropical ulcers on our legs. I've uh, built roads for the Japanese, worked out in the sun days on end, felling trees. Uh, We worked uh, on the Cooley Gang, those of us who were young and strong. We moved up to the back of the trucks. They hurled the big bags of rice and sugar on our backs, and you grabbed the ends of the uh, bags, and you walked away with it or else. There were many times when I thought my legs were going to crumble under me, and yet I uh, said, God, just help me to get this to the storehouse so I can throw it off my shoulder, and then you turned around and went back again. We had, among other things, that we raised for them pigs. We had a large pig pen that had a beautiful uh, cement floor that had to be kept clean. Uh, We had to cook three meals a day for those pigs. The camp commander went out into the jungle, or out into the villages near us. He shot dogs, brought them in. We skinned the dogs, cut them up, cooked them with the stems of the banana plants so that these pigs could have three hot meals a day. When the garbage came in from the coast, from the officers there, we always gave it the finger uh, test. You went through it like this, and if it didn't fall between your fingers, it was big enough to eat. And uh, we ate the dog's livers. When he found out that we were eating the livers from the dogs, it doesn't taste any different from cow's liver. Uh, We were told that if he ever caught any of us eating the dog's liver, that he was going to beat us up. We knew that he could because he had just killed one of the men up in the men's camp before he was brought down to our camp. And uh, so we were very careful that we weren't caught getting the dog's livers. Some of the other things we carried back, uh, hid them inside of our clothes so we could carry them back and have them for the kitchen for those that were in the hospital and those that were very ill. With the pigs, we got flies, and with the coming of the flies by the aliens into the camp. 
we had to kill, in spite of all of the other work we had to do, we had to kill flies, and you were uh, sometimes called up to his office, and he made you count the flies, lay them out, so that he could see that everybody had 100 flies a day. And uh, in spite of that, there still were just aliens of flies. They, we got dysentery in the camp, and of course the flies carried the dysentery everywhere. You couldn't sit down and eat your food without having flies in it. And uh, you kept going like this all the time you were eating. They brought in, sometimes we had sufficient food, sometimes we didn't. We said we never lost, uh, skipped any meals, but we sure postponed a lot of them. But uh, when they brought in these fish, boy, we didn't take anything off of them, and we didn't take anything out of them. And um, I can remember Mrs. Presswood sitting next to me, and she said, You know, darling, I could eat the head of that fish if it didn't look up at me so pitifully. I said, I long since lost my pity for here, and I gave her a piece of the tail of mine, and she would give me the head of hers. There's only, the only thing you can't eat about a fish is the pupil of the eye. It gets to be just like a hard little baby when it's cooked. We, uh, one day, uh, and if you were cooking porridge, you were up at 4 o'clock in the morning and stood there at this great big paddle and cooking in a 55-gallon drum the porridge for the villa, and you... Uh, this one day, it just tasted so good, it tasted just like it had bouillon in it. But when it got daylight so that we could actually see what was in our plates, there were hairs that were surfacing, and finally the tail of a rat turned up, and some feathers, and we realized uh, reconstructing must, must have happened during the night. There was a ledge right up above the drum for the porridge, and you soaked your rice during the night. And they must have been struggling there, the rat trying to get the bird, and both of them fell into the drum and drowned, and so they got cooked. But uh, we had um, so many people down with dysentery that finally there were 500 people down with dysentery, and the rats in our barracks, they were just bamboo mat walls with um, mud floors, and during the rain there was just mud constantly there, and double-decker bamboo racks on which we slept. And I've even had the, the rats eat my mosquito net and get into bed with me. And so now you know about these other rats, too. But I can remember one night when I awakened and I could look down uh, at where my toes were. I was on the upper rack, and there was a, an opening between the wall and the, uh, the roof, the grass roof. And the moonlight was showing me that there was a big rat coming right up my blanket toward me. And I quickly pulled my feet up, and I sat up, and I yelled uh, for Miss Kemp, who was down below me, to please pull my mosquito net out at the end, the head end, so that I could get the mosquito net between me and that big rat that was in bed with me. And finally she got it out, pulled it out, and when he made his, and he was just frantic, he was as frantic to get out of that bed as I was to have him get out. And uh, he was just going round and round, and I was just watching this rat going around there and trying to get the covers pulled up around my back. And finally she pulled this out, and I pulled it over my head and got it between me and him. And then I slid down the pole, and I got a club, and I went back up after him. But he made his escape by this time. We have had them to latch onto the toes and fingers of children that got their hands up at the mosquito net during the night and were sucking the blood out of the children's uh, extremities. Uh, when we had those that were down with dysentery and they could smell death, we finally came to the, the realization we had to set guards over them during the night hours to keep the rats off of them because they smelled death and were trying to get at our patients. It was a difficult time then. Those of us who were young were doing two and three jobs a day, running from one place to another. and. Uh, it was um, in the fall, uh, in November of 1943, when Mrs. Yaustra, who was the Dutch head under the Japanese camp commander, came over to the barracks this morning, and she said, to, uh, Mrs. Dibler, I want to talk to you for a few minutes. I thought about the work, and so we talked about it, and I said, I still have a number of young women here who are very helpful, and if anyone's sick, they just fill in, and so... We were doing two and three jobs a day, and I said, if there's anybody else that can't make it during that day, well, then we can call on these young women here, and I also am available. 
And finally she just stopped dead and she said, but I really didn't come to talk to you about the work. She said, your husband up in the camp in Pari Pari, which was 100 kilometers to the north of us, has been very ill. And then she stopped and I saw the tears in her eyes and I grabbed her shoulders. I said, Mrs. Yostra, you don't mean he's gone. She said, yes, he died three months ago up in the camp in Pari Pari. It was one of those moments when I thought my Lord had left me. I was like every young person. I was waiting for the day when the war would be over and I could go home to New Guinea to my people. And I just turned around and I went to the only one I knew to go to and I said, God. And immediately he answered me. He said, did I not say to you, my child, that when thou passest through the rivers, I would be with thee. And through the floods, they not overflow thee, and neither should the fire kindle upon thee. And I turned away and I said, Lord, all right. I learned in those days that there's a peace that cometh after sorrow of hope surrendered, not of hope fulfilled, a peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, but calmly on a tempest that is stilled. It's a peace that lives not now in joys, excesses, nor in the happy life of love secure, but in the unerring strength the heart possesses from conflicts won while learning to endure. It's a peace that is in sacrifice secluded a life subdued from will and passion free. Tis not the peace that over Eden brooded, but that which triumphed in Gethsemane. And I can tell you tonight, beloved, there is a peace through the comfort of the Holy Spirit that nobody can understand until you pass through it and know. We had had women who were taken away from our camp by the Kempe Thai. Some of them returned, some never came back again. Those that did return never talked about what happened to them. I ran up into the office and there was a table there in the center of the room and they were walking around me and I tried not to uh, learn Japanese because it was better, they thought, that you learn Japanese in order to spy on them. Languages have come easily for me but I tried not to learn it. I had certain commands I had to give in Japanese, and that was all I knew. And they, all I could understand was when they were laughing and poking fun at me, and it was America. And finally, one of them stopped, and he put the paper out in front of me. He said, is that your name? And I looked at it. I saw Darlene Dibler written on the paper. And I said, yes, sir, I am Darlene Dibler. And he said, what do you know about Morse code? I said, sir, I don't know a thing about Morse code. I have never learned it. And he said, you go over and he said, get another dress and come back. We're going to take you somewhere else to. And he said, we'll see how much you know about Morse code. So I ran back. I grabbed my Bible, another dress, and came back. And uh, I got into the car, was taken out of the camp, taken down to the city of Makassar, which I knew well, having lived there and worked there before. And I saw that they were pulling up in front of what had formerly been our native insane asylum. And I just cried out, Lord, why must I go through this? Wasn't it enough that you took Russell? And so sweetly my Lord answered me. He said, my child whom I love, I chasten. I said, all right, Lord. And then I remembered the last words that Dr. Jaffrey had ever said to me when they took him away from the camp. He leaned down over the tailgate of the truck and he said, Lassie, whatever you do, be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And as I followed the guard up to the office, all that I could think of was, God, make me a good soldier. And I said, Lord, if I ever come through this and I, anybody in America ever hears about these days, I don't want them to be ashamed of me as a fellow American. They grabbed my Bible the first thing. They said, you can't have that book. You'll be sitting in there reading that book and not thinking against, about your evil deeds against the Imperial Japanese Army. 
And then the guard uh, put his bayonet on his gun and he turned and put it into my back and he started putting me, running me through this first uh, um, cell block and I followed across the courtyard and then I saw that they were, he was moving me up this row of cells and when he stopped in front of one of the doors, I looked up at the door and written on the door in Indonesian with chalk was, Orang ini musti mati, this person must die, and I knew I was in death row. I went to those hearings. They said I had been an American spy. They said they had evidence. A Chinese fellow came in. He had confessed to them that he had seen me in the jungle with a radio having contact with the Allies, that I had been reporting on plane movements, on troop movements. And I said, but I have never been in a jungle with a radio. I have never done those things. I didn't realize what a sensitive spot that was right there between your eyes. And he had such large fingers, and he was very strong. And when he would flick me there until I felt like my, my head was going to burst, I caught a glimpse of myself one day walking by one of the windows, and I saw I had two large black eyes. They used judo chops on you, and I thought my neck was broken many a time. But I never shed a tear before them. But I'll be honest with you tonight, when I got back to that cell, and they locked that door. I wept buckets of tears. I'd just throw myself on the floor and I would just sob and sob. And I said, God, I can't go through another one. I just can't. And he'd always come and say, but my child, my grace is sufficient for you. And I'd sit up and as I felt the Lord's presence there with me and then I would begin to sing and I knew then why God had laid it on my heart two weeks before I was brought down to this prison in streams of the desert there was a poem I would begin to sing he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater he sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added affliction he addeth his mercy to multiply trials his multiplied peace when we have exhausted our store of endurance and our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, Father's full giving is only begun. His love knows no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. By this time, I was very, very thin. When I came into the cell, I had dysentery. I knew that, but I had not gone into the hospital because we had to have these younger people. We had to do the extra work that was there to do. And the first day, they threw in a plate, a tin plate that had some rice on it with a little bit of sugar at the top, and I was so upset I couldn't eat it. So he came and grabbed it again, and he said, well, if you don't like sugar, you'll never get it again, and he didn't. Then when they realized I had dysentery, they took me off of the whole rice and put me on rice porridge. That was something else. And when they put that first plate of porridge in there, and there was no sugar, no cream with it, I looked down at it, and I thought, I saw all this white stuff on the top, and I said, oh, joy, somebody knows I love fresh grated coconut. And I picked it up. And I got over to the door where I could see from the light coming in the transom, it wasn't coconut, it was worms. It was just filled with worms. And I remember thinking, oh boy, that's a new experience. And I'm going to shove them all up on the side of the plate. And I was picking these worms out and I had them all around the plate. And of course, with the dysentery, in came these big blue bottle flies and they just lit on that plate. And right there, and they were eating those worms, and I thought, now that's no good. If they can eat the worms, so, so can I. And I could thank God. I honestly could thank him for that plate of rice porridge, worms and all, because I knew I could have been there without anything to eat. And one day I had climbed up because I was having an attack of malaria, and I got up to the transom above the door, and I was hanging on there, and I had one foot on the doorknob and the other foot over on the windowsill. 
and I was hanging there and I was trying to get air on my face because of the, the uh, terrible fever from the malaria. And I saw, I could see the courtyard there. There was an overhang of the roof, so nobody could see me, but I could see them. And I was so fascinated to see other women. And most of them were native women there just for minor misdemeanors. And they were allowed to walk around that courtyard in the afternoon. And uh, I saw this one woman, and she every time she uh, saw the guard go that way, she went this way. And then when she heard him click his heels and stop and make his turn, she stopped dead. And she was edging off toward that, uh, the fence that was at one end of the courtyard. It was covered with Honolulu creeper. And I watched her, and, and there she was down there next to that fence. And he turned around, and he went that way. And through that Honolulu creeper came a hand, and on that hand was a big bunch of bananas. And seeing those bananas, oh, I wanted anything to eat. I could smell those bananas. I could remember the taste of bananas. Oh, I wanted a banana. It was like a physical hurt within me. And I got right down off that door, and I got on my knees, and I said, Lord, I'm not asking you for a whole bunch of bananas like she has. Could I have just one banana, Lord? And I said, please, Lord, don't think that I am not grateful for this rice porridge. I really am. And I'm sorry if I ask for a banana and, and you can't get a banana in here to me. And I really didn't see how God could ever get a banana in there. Sometimes when the ships were in, they brought in the officers and you were put out on display and uh, you had to be sure you made a proper bow at a 45 degree angle and then at a 90 degree angle when if it wasn't pleasing to them, you went right down and I was waiting because I heard. My ears became very sensitive to sound. And uh, when they were coming across the courtyard, I could tell there were officers coming. And uh, I had just a skin and bone by this time. And I said, Lord, I need strength to be able to stand up here and to make my bow properly when that door opens. So you help me now, Lord. And the guard came and he got the wrong key in the door. And so I sat down for a minute. I was so weak. And I could hear officers talking out there. And finally, he uh, got the door open. And I stood up very rapidly. But there, standing in the doorway, was the camp commander, the Japanese camp commander from that other camp from which I had been brought down to this prison. And he was smiling. And it had been so long since I had seen a friendly face since I'd seen anyone smile. I was so excited, I just clapped my hands. I said, oh, Ton Yamaji, so pretty liat so white young lama. I said, Mr. Yamaji, it's just like seeing an old friend. And the tears came in his eyes. He turned and he walked right out of the cell, never said a word to me. For a long time, he talked to those other men who had been trying me. I don't really know what he said, but I think he was telling them about the day when I heard that Russell was dead had been dead for three months and he called me over in the afternoon hours and he said I just wanted to talk to you and I uh, he said uh, you know this is war I said yes Mr. Dema Yamaji I understand that he said you know what you heard today many women in Japan have also heard I said I understand that too and he said you're very young he said someday the war really will be over and you can go back to America and you can marry, you could go dancing, you can go to the theaters and forget about these awful days. And I said, Mr. Yamaji, may I have permission to speak to you? You always ask permission first. And he motioned for me to sit down on a chair on the other side of his desk, and I sat down there, and I said, I just want to tell you that I don't sorrow like people who have no hope. I want to tell you about somebody I came to know when I was nine years of age back in Boone, Iowa, in America. And the Lord gave me the most beautiful opportunity to lay the plan of salvation before that Japanese officer. I knew from that moment on that man was my friend. And I really believe that God did a great work in that man's heart. And I believe that's what he was telling those men there that day because their heads kept getting lower and lower. I believe he was pleading my cause. He finally came back into the cell 
And he looked down at me and he said, oh, you're very ill, aren't you? And I said, yes, Mr. Umaji, I am. And he said, I'm going back to the camp now. He told me later he had spent three whole days going from office to office before he finally got permission to come in to see me. And he said, I'm going back to the camp. The women are all wondering about where you are, what is happening to you. He didn't tell me at that time that they had, these men had sent word back to the camp that I was dying of tuberculosis, said we'll never return her to camp because she's dying of tuberculosis, not wanting them to know that I was going to be beheaded. And he said, I'm going back now. Have you any word for the women back at the camp? And I said, yes, Mr. Yamaji. When you go back, would you tell them that I am all right, that I am still trusting in the Lord? And I said, they'll understand, and you'll understand, Mr. Yamaji. And that man nodded his head, and he walked out of the cell. He was gone just as soon as that door was locked, and I heard them walk away. It hit me. I hadn't bowed to any of those Gestapo men. I thought, Lord, why could you not have helped me to remember to bow to them? Just as soon as Yamaji's gone, they're going to come and get me and take me back to the hearing room. And please, Lord, I don't want to go through another one of those. And then I heard the guard coming, and I knew he was coming for me. And I stood up and I said, Lord, I need strength to walk to that hearing room. But when the door went open, Mr. the guard walked in and he just laid them all out on the floor. Do you know what they were? bananas. I sat down and I counted them. There were 92 bananas. I don't know what you would have done, but I pushed those up in the corner just as far from me as I could get them, and that wasn't very far because I don't have much character. And I said, Lord, I have no right to eat those bananas. I said, yesterday I was telling you there was no way in the world you could even get one banana into me. And you know, so sweetly he came and he said, oh, that's what I delight to do, the exceeding abundant, above anything you ask or think. We live like poverty-stricken people when God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the silver and gold is his. Just because of our unbelief, and uh, the day I peeled the last banana in all these months, I never had a bath, I never had a drink of water, and I was dehydrated, and I said, Lord, um, please, Lord, I know that I'm going to be beheaded because they had told me I was to be beheaded as an American spy. And I said, Lord, uh, I just need strength to stand and be a good soldier for you and a good American. I don't want anybody to be ashamed of me. And the Lord began to speak to me through three phrases of a verse in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians that says, who delivered and doth deliver, he will yet deliver. And I would say, Lord, I know. I thank you that you have delivered me from the law of sin and death, and I am free. Even though I'm a prisoner here, I'm free, I'm free. And he would come right back, who delivered and doth deliver, he will yet deliver. And I said, Lord, how could you ever get me out of this place? And that day they, they came, they said, the guard said, we're going to take you somewhere else. And just as we got to the road, I knew that to go back to the other camp where the women were, that I would turn left. We didn't. We turned right, went right up to the Gestapo headquarters where the executions took place. They gave us the last meal. I, uh, the other man who was the brains of the team that had been trying me, he stood in front of me and he had the great sheaves of paper that he had written on. He always was just out of my, my line of vision so I could not watch the expressions on his face but he could watch my face. And he said, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And he said, you are worthy of death. And he drew his finger across his throat and he slapped the, the hilt of his sword and he started to draw that out. And when I saw that sword coming out, I just cried out, oh God. And I felt like my blood had turned to jello. And at that very instant when that sword was coming out, 
that man I heard cars coming from all directions and the brakes would screech and they start to yell before they jumped out of their uh, the jeeps and they were running inside of the office and there was ceramic tile on the floor and they were running in all directions and they yelled for this man and he went into the office and then he was in there quite a while I could hear their voices in there and talking rapidly and they were excited I don't know what happened I only know that somehow in the providence of God he spared this unworthy person. He grabbed me and he took me out and he slammed me into a jeep and put two bottles of wine in my lap and said those are for Mr. Yamaji and that jeep started down that road and we were going like we were being pursued. But we got back to the camp and just as we were going through the gate and I thought I'm going to be free of them. And he reached forward and he grabbed my arm and of course I was just skin and bone. And he nearly broke my arm. I had all I could do to grip my teeth and say, God, don't let me scream, don't let me scream. And he said, if you ever, ever tell anybody anything that happened to you, I'll get you the next time. Oh, fear came over me. I knew that he could. And he said, you'll never come out the next time. Finally, I came back to the barracks. Oh, the fear that had been on me. I was so afraid my mind was going. Fear is of the devil. It was like a physical cloak on me. One day I knew after having spent nine, six days and I didn't dare sleep at night. At night I would lie there and I would go through the, the scriptures I had memorized. And I would just cry to God to spare me, keep me from losing my mind. And finally I went out and I walked on the grassy plot back behind the area where we ate. And I said, God, I've tried with everything that was within me to keep my mind. And I said, I, don't, I need sleep now. I'm not well. And I can't go on like this. And I literally threw my arms out. I said, I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm it was just like arms went underneath me and I began to sing a song written by Dr. A.B. Simpson. It says, underneath thee, oh, how precious. You have not to mount on high, but to rest upon his promise and a trustful resting lie. And I saw it. I've been trying to reach up to God. I've been trying to commend myself to God. And when we've done the best that we can, we're still unprofitable servants. And the arms went underneath me and billows of peace just rolled over me and all the fear was gone. The fear of going back under them, these men again. And God just filled me with his presence. We'd had bombings the year before. We had dug our own slit trenches so that we could have some protection. They were bombing the airfields, shrapnels flying into the camp. And no matter whether it was raining at night or not, we had, as soon as the alarm went, we heard planes in the distance. We had to get out. We had to get into those ditches. And many is the night when I stood with an improvised spear that my boys had made for me, the boys that were there. When I speak of my boys, these were the young men who were from the families that were there in the barracks over which I was head. And they'd made this spear, and I would watch for mad dogs because we had mad dogs coming into the camp. The Salavis is known for rabid dogs, rabies everywhere at certain the times of the year. And we had some that were bitten by them. There was nothing to give them. All you could do was just lock them in a shed out at the edge of the camp and wait for death to come. Horrible, horrible death. We had lost more being bitten by the mad dogs than we did to the bombings. And we had not had in all those years any letters, Red Cross packages, no pamphlets, nothing. We were locked away within that camp. We didn't know what was happening in the outside world. And one year and two years and three years, and we were coming to our fourth year. And I remember that one day when just about noon we saw a plane, a lone plane, coming out of the east, and as it came down over the camp, it was low enough so that we could see American insignia on the side. An American boy was flying that plane. And then where it, it, he dropped, suddenly dropped over our camp, one of the auxiliary gasoline tanks. I felt angry. I thought, how dare you do that with all these women and children here? How dare you drop that over us? 
But I think he was trying to warn us that they were coming the next day, but none of us got the message. We didn't know where the Americans were. We it was, came to the place where you thought, I'll spend the rest of my life in this camp of two acres square behind this barbed wire and the moat on the outside of the barbed wire. And then the next day we looked and we saw suddenly that there was there were many planes coming. They were moving out of the east and they were coming toward our camp and everybody got out there and stopped their work and we dropped our shovels and our picks and we looked up at all these planes coming, beautiful double fuselage planes. We'd never seen them before, P-38 Lightnings. And suddenly there were silver things coming from the backs of the planes and some were yelling, canned goods. And I said, no chocolate bars. And others were saying, no, they're pamphlets. And we were all yelling something. And then we heard the whistling of the bombs and we knew we were wrong. And over that little camp of two acres square, they laid 5,000 incendiary bombs. In just minutes, everything was going up in flames. I ran, I jumped into the ditch where we, I were supposed to lie when there were bombings. And the minute my feet hit the bottom of that ditch, the Lord said, you borrowed a Bible from that little Chinese woman. I said, that's right, Lord, I have no right to let it burn. And I jumped out of the ditch and I ran to the barracks that was burning and I grabbed that Bible off of my upper rack and I came out and I saw that they finally had opened the gate so we could get out of this burning holocaust. And I ran to the gate with others and we went through it. We got down there and here we were just in a beehive of Japanese soldiers. There were 138,000 soldiers around that camp. We didn't even know they were there. They had their machine guns set up and they yelled, T-Door and you t -door. They just turned on you with their guns, with the bayonets fixed on them and you just threw yourself out on the ground and they were running over the tops of us to get to their machine guns and they began to machine gun the planes and of course the planes just turned around and came down and they strafed us with machine gun bullets and I dropped my hand onto my, uh, my head onto my hand and I said, God, if at the end of this day anybody's alive, it will be a miracle. When the last of the planes had gone and the dust, the sound of the planes was no longer audible and I could see that all of these things that had been burning had stopped burning and there was smoke uh, coming up out of the camp. And I thought, Lord, I'm alive. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. I finally found Mrs. Presswood. I said, let's go back up to where our barracks was. Maybe we can find our tin cans, our spoons, something that has uh, been preserved even in the fire. We got up to where the barracks had been, and nobody knew that I had my bride's book sewn inside a native mat. How it happened, only God knows. But when that barracks burned, it fell backwards. The beds came down, the mat burned away, and must have been the wind that blew the, the bride's book open. And there in the center, on that beautiful black page, was this brilliant gold ink standing out of the certificate. And I looked down at it, and the sun, the last rays of the sun, was making that gold to shine. And I said, Lord, that was the only thing I had left. Couldn't I just have that? And the minute I touched it, it just completely disintegrated. I said, that was all I had. And he said to me, my child, that's what I want to do with you. I want to make you like pure gold, even if I have to take you through the fire seven times. I stood up and I said, all right, Lord, I'm available. I saw that the lady in the barracks, head of the barracks next to me was crying and I went over to her and I put my arm around her and I said, please don't cry. She said, my mattress burned. I said, oh yes, everything's burned, but we have much to thank God for. We're still alive. She said, but I didn't leave it in the barracks. I grabbed it off my bed and I took it out and I threw it in the ditch where you always lie. I walked over to that ditch and right there where I had been lying was the ashes from her mattress and the casing from the bomb. I stood up. I walked away. I have never known such awe in the presence of my Lord. 
And I said, Father, it wasn't that woman's Bible you were concerned about, was it? You knew that was one way to get me out of that ditch. I said, God, whatever days you give me on this earth from now on, I want you to really know that it all belongs to you. They took us up into the jungle. They had known this bombing was coming because they had prepared very crude soldiers up there. They came back again three days later and they bombed us with shrapnel bombs. And then one day they called at the camp and they said, and this was two weeks after peace was signed, they told us that the war was over. I couldn't imagine leaving the camp. I didn't know where I was going. And they allowed me to go up and, and uh, act as the interpreter for the Japanese and the Allied officials because I knew English, I knew the Indonesian, I knew the Dutch. And Mr. Yamaji had dismissed the other man who was a translator and he took me in to help. And through this, the uh, Australian major gave word to the American boys who were on the coast and out of 300 that were reported there when the war started and they were taken prisoner only 97 of those boys survived and they had rigged up a little radio and sent out an SOS and it was picked up by an American plane that went over and that those American planes were coming in and they were ferrying those boys out to get them to medical help and this a major said there is an American boy who's going to come up and see you and I'll never forget the day and, and we had had after the bombing we had about one comb for nine people and livestock was plentiful and I just cut my hair off just real short because we as far as we knew the war would go on for years yet and I was a mess my feet, of course, we had never had shoes in all those years, and that was good for strengthening our feet. But when this boy came in, and he was an American boy, and he was very well dressed because they had gotten clothes from the, the uh, Americans who were ferrying them out, and he said, uh, I understand there's an American girl here, and someone pointed me out, and I felt so embarrassed because he kept looking at my feet and they weren't all that dirty and I was so embarrassed I sat down on the edge of this little hut and I pulled my feet up underneath me and he said don't you have any shoes and I said oh no we haven't had shoes but that's all right I said uh, that's good for your feet he said I'm gonna get you some shoes I, I he said I, I I guess I must tell you I'm I'm an American boy and my name is Tom saw so uh, is uh, Tom Sawyer and it was just on the tip of my tongue to say, yeah, I'm Becky Thatcher. <laughs> I didn't know if he had a sense of humor or not, so I thought I better not say that. So I said, yes, I am an American girl. He said, yes, I heard you up here. He said, do you have anything that you really need right now? And I said, we need food for our children. Then they said, all right, we're not supposed to take any women and children. If I had not gone with these boys, the next year I would still have been in the camp because there was no provision made for moving those women out of that camp. They said, well, we'll take you on the last plane load, we'll hide you, and we'll get you across to Borneo, Balikpapa, and then on up to the Palawan Islands and then to Manila, and somehow you'll be able to get home again to America. I remember that day, the 19th day of September, 1945, when I stood there and I was getting into the little boat to be rowed out to the plane that was there in the harbor. And I thought, as I rowed out to that plane, Lord, here I am going home, widowed at 26, with not a thing in the world that I could call my own. Got to Balikpapa in South Borneo. They took us to the hospital immediately. And they said, is there anything special you'd like to have? And I said, I'd like a shower. We had so little soap and so little water. And I said, I, I would like to have a hot shower. Could we have a hot shower? And so they said, oh, yes. Well, I didn't say hot because I didn't think anybody had hot showers anymore. But they took us there. And there was hot water. And we just had and soap. And it smelled nice. 
And we just showered and soaped, and then we'd rinse, and then we'd soap some more. And I don't know how long we were in there until we heard a sound of a knock on the door and said, girls, um, we have tea ready. See, this is an Australian camp. We have tea ready for you. And uh, if you want to shower later on, you can have another shower. <laughs> So we sat down at the table. I tell you, it was an unusual experience to be using a knife and fork again. We have Welsh rarebit, and it just tasted so delicious. And then that night, they, we got into the hospital. I was taking 18 different kinds of vitamins and medicine at every meal. I said, I'll need food after I get this down. <laughs> but they decided we needed our hair properly cut and then they gave us a permanent and I ran over to the place where I wanted to go. I sent a telegram home, said I'm coming home alone at Russell's with the Lord and I waited for news to come from my family in America and I would go into the post office and the young man was there and I said have you any mail today for Darlene Dibler and he would look, he said, no, I'm sorry, there's nothing here. And I went day, back day after day. And finally, one day, he just said, boy, I don't know why somebody wouldn't write to you. I was so embarrassed. I didn't go back again until the day before they were going to ship us out. They kept us almost a month there until they felt we were strong enough to go home. And then I ran back that day, and I said, do you have any mail for me now? And he looked again. He said, no, there's nothing for you here. And we got on that ship. We were 23 days coming home on the Clip Fontaine. We were just within spitting distance of the shore of San Francisco. And they, they came out over the loudspeaker and said, just pull her out again. Everything is full. Take it on up to Seattle, Washington. And uh, everybody was moaning and groaning, oh, this beautiful city. And I said, oh, I don't know anybody out in California anyway. And I've never been there. And I said, this is known territory to me. I'm glad to even stay on this ship for another three days. And then we pulled in here to Seattle, Washington on Navy Day, the end of November, 1945. And that night they deloused us. And, and then the next morning they started to process us. And I remember when they, uh, they, these people who had become friends of mine during the trip home were leaving and their families were coming and I, went out and I crawled. We were sleeping three deep in hammocks out on the deck and I crawled in under those hammocks and I suddenly realized dad and mother are gone too. That's why I have not heard from anybody. And I said, Lord, you took Russell. Did you have to take mother and daddy too? And so sweetly he said, you can still trust me, my child. I got up and I said, Lord, I need to find a Red Cross woman. I need to get some money or something to get back to Iowa to trace anybody from my family that might still be alive. And I came around the, the corner of the deck and there was a Red Cross woman and I latched onto her and I said, now wait a minute. I said, I'm a POW. I said, I haven't heard anything from my family for over four years. And I said, I guess maybe they're gone, but I would need to get back to Iowa. Maybe somebody from the family's alive. She said, honey, what's your name? I said, Darlene Dibler. She said, I've been on the ship all morning looking for you. I have three telegrams, and they're all for mother and dad. But you know, oh, I thank God that he didn't let me meet that woman until I had met him. And I knew that even if mother and dad and the rest of them were gone, I could still trust my Lord. You know, it's wonderful that God brings you to that place where it's faith without trappings. Just faith in the testimony of a person that you've walked with for all these years. That even, I think maybe in a measure, it was like Job said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Because I knew the character of my God. I opened them up. Mother said we moved out to Oakland, California in 1943. We knew you were on the ship. We tried to get over there, and when they took you out, we can't get to Seattle in time to meet you, but we're sending money, and it's at uh, Western Union. Now you go and get that, and then you get a ticket and come down to Oakland, California, and we'll be here to meet you, and you call us collect as soon as you can get to a telephone. I got to a telephone. You know, I've said so many times tonight, the Lord spoke to me. And people say, how do you know it is the Lord? I think this is the best illustration I could ever use. 
I had not heard my mother or father's voice for over eight years. But when that telephone went up, that receiver on the other end down there in Oakland, California, and I heard someone say, hello, Darlene, I knew it was mother. Nobody ever said my name like my mother did. That's the way it is with my Lord. When he says, my child, I know it's my Lord. And I listen. She told me my brother had just gotten in from Germany on the East Coast. The first thing he asked his mother, have you any word from Darlene? She said, I know she's on a ship and she's on her way up to Seattle, Washington. And so I went to the train station to get a ticket to Oakland, California after collecting the money at Western Union. And when I told him that I wanted a ticket for Oakland, California, he said, my dear, he said, don't you know a war's been on? He said, only Army and Navy personnel travel. And my heart just collapsed with him. And I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, I'm a POW. I just got here. And I said, I'm trying to get to Oakland, California, because my mother and dad are down there. He said, oh, I've got lots of tickets for people just like you. And I was in business again. <laughs> And then I went back to the ship to collect my things, and you know they'd given us coats from the Red Cross that came from another area, era, another time. And I noticed that everybody who had a coat on on the streets there, the nap was very short and it was very smooth for uh, material. So I got back on the ship and I went to the captain and I said, I'd like to borrow your razor. I gave my coat a shave. <laughs> It looked pretty good after that. <laughs> then I got on the, I got on the train and I sent a cable to, or I sent a wire to my mother and dad uh, from uh, Portland. I thought I better tell them when I'm coming in, and I said, "Kill the fatted calf. I love you, darling." And I'm arriving at 11:30 tomorrow morning, and uh, my mother. My father told me this. He said, Mother heard the telephone in the middle of the night. I didn't realize. You see, I've been really out of it for so long that they, when you send a telegram, it goes right straight through. And it was in the middle of the night. And Dad said, Mother went to the phone, and I could hear her say, What? And then there was silence, and she said, What? And, oh. And she put the phone down, she ran in and grabbed my father, and she said, she's all right, she hasn't lost her sense of humor. <laughs> and they were, the, sec the uh, woman who was reading it to her kept saying, kill the fatted calf, love, Darlene. She knew the lost was found, the wanderer had returned home again. And there they were, oh, a great group of people from the church there. I didn't know any of them. So I was just looking for two faces. I was looking for mother and daddy's face. And I remember when I put my arms around them, and I just sobbed. I said, oh, there were so many days. I thought I would never, ever see you again. And then as I held them tight, I thought, you know, if this is wonderful, meeting your loved ones you haven't seen for such a long time, what is it going to be like when someday those clouds will part asunder? And Jesus will be there. I was a little girl, just 10 years of age, when I sat in a missionary conference, the closing service, and they were calling for those that would give their life to go wherever God sent them. It was all geared toward our high school and our college young people. But somebody knew that for the second seat from the back was a little 10-year-old brown-haired girl. And I felt a hand on my shoulder that night, and I turned around and looked, and there was no one there, and I knew it was my Lord. He said to me, my child, would you go anywhere, no matter what it costs? I was so thrilled to think that God even noticed me. With such love and adoration in my heart, I looked up into his face that night and I said, Lord Jesus, I would go anywhere for you, no matter what it costs. I understand something of the cost, beloved, but I don't even think about that anymore. 
I'd go anywhere for him. I'll tell you why tonight, because the compensations are so tremendous. I wouldn't trade places with any of you tonight. Those were not terrible years. They were the sweetest years that God ever gave me because then he taught me that he would never leave me nor forsake me. I heard him call, come follow, that was all. My gold grew dim. I rose and followed him. Oh, beloved, who wouldn't follow if they heard him call?